Hello, everyone, and welcome to Profiles and Risk. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. On this special video episode, I think we'll make it audio too at some point. Um, I, I'm not sure if they'll align completely. I got my buddy here, Brett Fulmer. Brett, welcome. Thanks for having me, Nick. Looking forward to rapping a little bit about insurance, Celtics, probably a few things. Yeah, so this is going to be a little bit different. When Brett and I were discussing how we were going to you know, have this particular conversation, uh, we kept it open. So this is an agenda-free Profiles and Risk where Brett and I are just going to rap and we may have a special guest. So this is going to be like a first all the way around for... Freeform. Yes, free Freeform Saturday. Yeah. But uh, this is going to be fun. So Brett, uh, how... How did we connect? I think Tony, I think LinkedIn, he and I talked a little bit about my experience at a small local shop. You know, he kept pushing me towards commercial lines, which I think is a, a great feature mm -hmm. that he always does. And I just fell in love with the community. Um, having been in the insurance industry for three or four months at that point, uh, when getting you know asked to write on insurancenerds.com, I thought that was a really cool opportunity just to put some ideas together, uh, talk about my path, and now knowing that it's basically everybody's, you don't mean to get into insurance, but at one point it just starts making sense. You know, you see it from the outside and you're like, I can sell that and get paid every year. Everyone has to have it. You know, what's the catch? I guess the catch is it's a crowded space and it's going through a lot of change, but I still think it's just tremendous opportunity and I plan to kind of plat my flag, you know, kind of in and around insurance, you know, for the rest of my, you know, 30 plus career. So looking mm -hmm. forward to it. Yeah, the, the catch is that everyone else saw what you saw. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, yeah. in you know, decades ago, insurance was a honorable it was considered an honorable career. Mm -hmm. um, insurance professionals were considered the best salespeople. Okay. You know? So, which is interesting, you know, like because if you think about it, like back then, they you, we didn't have agencies like the way we have them now. It was a lot of door to door. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I'm going to put a note down here. The farmer from Myrna, mm. you ever heard of that? No, not at all. That is the story of State Farm. Okay. And that is a farmer from Myrna who was pretty pissed off that he couldn't get uh, inexpensive auto insurance. Mm. And the thing is, he was being charged the same rate as folks in like New York City. Mm. And he thought that was preposterous because out in Illinois where he was in, they, you know, it, it was very rural. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities and the probabilities of like actually having a car accident were very small, yet he was paying the same rate. So uh, he created State Farm and he sold door to door. There you go. He went, he went, you know, area to area and, uh, and sold it. So I'm going to make sure I put that in the show notes. I think you can get the book for like a dollar used. Well, uh, and that kind of comes back to what you guys are doing today with, you know, geospatial data and flood. You don't need to use the same broad mat, broad brush. You know, he split that up into rural and city, it sounds like. And, you yeah. know, from what I've heard you talk about, you know, elevation, distance to the coast, all sorts of other, you know, things involved. I think as we get smarter and, you know, what you're talking about with insurance getting crowded, you know, people see ways to differentiate and enable smarter uses within the structure. Yeah, well, that's that's one of my biggest frustrations, though. You say that, I say that. I'm like completely focused on how do, how how can we be different mm -hmm. than the next Joe. Uh, then you have a lot of carriers. I, I was at a carrier where uh, they had this like giant celebration, patting themselves mm -hmm. on the back because they issued a high net worth or high valued home homeowners policy, and I started to look through the product. Got, you know, the, the, the product guide, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the features and benefits of it. I'm like, I'm not sure how this is any different than Chubb, AIG, Nationwide, yeah. Ace at the time. Uh, that's a big frustration of mine. I, I, I sort of think in terms of differentiation. I always mm -hmm. want to be different. Even if it costs me, um, you know, economically, I just think it's a safer, firmer, it's a firmer place to, to be in. What do you what do you think of like I, I would like to hear your opinion about differentiation from both uh, the industry perspective but also your career development? 
Right. Um, and actually, when you, you mentioned you want to be different, do you mean value add, uh, different benefit? Um, it could be anything. It could, okay. To me, different means you offer the same product at a much lower price. Okay, that could be that could be different. Like you have an advantage, mm -hmm. but but generally I'm thinking, you know, like for flood, for instance, it would have been very easy for me to go into residential. You know, there, Lloyd's is there. Mm -hmm. There's you know, a, a, there's a whole bunch of companies okay. there. It's getting crowded, more crowded yeah. by the day. We just we decided to go into commercial. Why? Nobody's there. Right. No, it's smart. I mean, that's a very I want to say Lao Tzu, but it's very Eastern philosophy way to approach it. I was actually a comparative religions major. Um, I don't think I realized the real world kind of existed till I was 23, but I thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed studying comparative religions. And, you know, don't fight the same fight as everybody else. Find the open door, you know, be enthusiastic. Um, to me, if all the products are the same, you want to find the growth market. If I ran an agency today, and it may be overly obvious, but, you know, Cannabis based in California, drones, you grow with the aspects that are growing um, because from the outside, the markets look pretty, pretty set uh, for traditional lines. So you can network into relationships, maybe broker a record, but I think what you're doing is intelligent because, you know, like you're saying, commercial space for flood isn't something people put a lot of focus into. So looking for those places that haven't been, you know, passed through in 30, 40, 50 years with fresh ideas. And I think that's you know, really what technology does is just make what exists smarter. You know, I'm not sure I go back and forth with people on this. It invents anything, you know, even a spreadsheet people used to do by hand, but now we do it on Excel and then you have Airtable, which will pull from different directions and is a really useful tool. Um, we're just making things smarter and just, you got to look for those caveats where people haven't engaged those spaces yet. And I think it's great to scale up to commercial. If you've seen a ton of people doing it in residential. Um, another thing I'll kind of do is, keep an eye out for products that haven't gone into the insurance space, but could be helpful. And like uh, I talked to a guy at Merge In, um, real nice guy out of Ohio, but he had a retail facing app and insurance wasn't there yet. So I just bugged him, let him know. Um, yeah, just look at what tech is out there that isn't used in our space yet and kind of apply it over. Yeah, my, I, I think generally, the way, the way I peer out into you know, my crystal ball, Mm -hmm. of insurance. I look at um, what are the pain points? Well, you know, let me back up. I look at why, why are people buying it to begin with? Mm -hmm. What's the reason? And some of it is regulatory. Some of it is there's a real risk there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's like all different other com combinations of things. Then I extend forward and think about what are the pain points? In the process, like think about commercial auto, it's uh, it's regulatorily man mandated, right? So if you have a if you have a truck on the road, you have to buy insurance. It's uh, high, a lot of exposure, all different kinds yeah. of exposure, and yet the industry cannot seem to get the loss costs, the the uh, loss ratios under control. So to me, it's like opportunity, like. Mm -hmm exposure people have to buy it there's an opportunity and then and then i search for technology like I, what is the pain point how do we solve that pain point and yeah, well, I, think, I think of the entire model and try to fig, figure out like a checkbox basically mm -hmm. like how are we selling it how is it being sold what's the pain point there checkbox use some kind of technology to fix that well, uh you know loss cost loss control uh claims you know whatever underwriting what are the pain points? And then I just, I try to fill in the technology to solve those problems. And it kind of reminds me of what we're doing at my day job right now. I got recruited to a 130 year old lobbying and advocacy company that had a robust business services arm. And they had a standard call in line and they had a librarian that you call and get emailed. And we lost some market share to people who were just quick and easy services online. So we didn't want to lose the back end of the house, um, but we definitely needed to make a more robust front end to kind of meet people in the technology of today. If you're a major carrier that's focused on commercial auto insurance, you know, the structure, the basis, the backing, the reinsurance, that's all going to stay the same, but how can you use a smartphone? How can you check the engine? How can you ferret through where the major losses are from? And if it's from, you know, theft, if it's from collision, if it's from 
accidents. I think that's a great place for a deep data dive too. Completely. You know, just, yeah, just looking at what the common themes are. Um, I mean, t telematics. I, right. The, the last, my last exposure to commercial auto, the big issues were we really didn't know who were driving the trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We had we had a pretty good idea of what they were driving, mm -hmm. you know, but we weren't exactly sure. So that's a problem too, and we had no idea where those trucks were going. So when they fill out an application, they're saying, you know, a certain kind of truck with a certain kind of load, and a certain kind of radius that they drive in, and then we would find the trucks and zip codes that <laughs> that we just, you know, they weren't supposed to be there. Yeah, I, uh, I worked at a moving company and not to give away trade secrets or to maybe get a great idea for somebody, maybe we should shut off the podcast for a second. But if you almost did like an on demand for a trucking industry where you had like a quick form, you have to fill out who's driving, maybe their social, where they're driving to, what they're carrying, and you're only covered per that data entry per trip, that could be a way to shut it down, you know, a lot. And you couldn't do that. 30 yeah, but years you, ago. you know, I, I thought about that, but that in that inevitably is going to invite conflict, right? Okay. Oh, because then you're you're writing off less what you're doing. You're trying to somehow save some money on what the exposure that you're covering. What's you know what's the whole Bill Wilson thing with you know mm -hmm. with the you know the book that he just published? You know, read the effing policy. Right. No one reads the policy. Right. And yeah. so, from from an underwriter's perspective, see, this is the communication part of insurance. From an underwriter's perspective, yeah, like we could really uh, line, red line a lot of the policy to make sure, enforce mm -hmm. what it is that we're trying to enforce, enforce from an mm -hmm. underwriting standpoint. But the customer may not follow through, uh, not due to any kind of malice. Right. So this, to me, that's the opportunity is, how can you find the right accounts, the right exposures, mm -hmm. where the accounts would actually be willing to work with you and, and kind of, broker as well, like to truly say, listen, we have this exposure. We have a trucking company. We have this exposure. We want the best. We want the right coverage. Maybe they want the best coverage, but they want the right coverage at the right price. They want it economical. The industry has not been able to make that work. Hey, you know, uh, company X Y Z, we'll work with you. We'll figure out a technological solution where. You know, we won't o overburden ourselves with expenses trying to keep your losses under control, but we got to find a way to keep your losses under control. Yeah. You know, um, there's a lack of that. There's a lack of, you know, you see it in some really big commercial accounts. You know, you'll have like the Chubbs, the AIGs, the FM Globals, where they'll have a lot of loss control and they'll, there's, you know, a lot of conversation with the insureds, but. Once you get to like the middle market and lower, there's, there's nothing. It's basically like you, you buy my policy or you don't. And then kind of write and run to, you know, they'll place the policy, but they got to pick up so many other small business ones in order to make it effective. You know, they're not going to sit on top of it. Um, I kind of chuckled. I have a friend who only does aviation insurance and he talked about how people show up at the office in their suit with their tie on. They're really well behaved. They're going to be perfect. He's like, I know these guys are taking naps in their plane. I know these guys are probably letting their friends drive. Like, you know, it's just kind of funny, the, uh, the vacuum of decision-making versus the, the grittiness of reality, you know? Yeah. Did, yeah. did you hear the episode with Lawanda Hall? I don't believe so. Is that the recent one, the regulatory? No, r yeah. risk management. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So she's a risk manager at a global auto company. And, you know, that's, they're lucky. They have a risk manager. They have okay. like an entire unit and that's their job is to, to scour the company, look for, you know, potential slip and falls, make sure, you know, keep workers comp claims at a minimum, uh, manage the commercial auto. So I think it's some, at some level and above, right? Mm -hmm. The company has the resources to be able to really manage uh, the, the exposure, which therefore gives them a lower premium. Middle market and below don't. So to me, how can we use technology to replicate what we do on large commercial, but I've instead of middle market? I kind of went back and forth to Tony on this a while back. Uh, I think there's a huge gap right now between, and this is more on the private line side, uh, people who don't want to be hassled to work on a 98 Toyota Camry, which I totally get, or a you know, $200,000 house, you know. And then 
there's technology that lets people bind way too easily and buy coverage without knowing what they need. So I think there's room for AI. And then also before you bind to have some sort of committal video. Um, I know we give people policies. I know you can send out an expert, but even before somebody signs on a digital dotted line, I think there should be some sort of class they're probably gonna ignore, you know, some sort of online video that they're not gonna pay too much attention to, but something that's gonna give them the tools to help, you know, them engage and elevate themselves. Yeah, I went. I just came back from the National Flood Conference, mm-hmm. and I saw a panel on communication of risk. Okay. And Joe Rossi, who's been on uh, my podcast before, and I'll have him on again. Uh, he's he's a friend of mine, and so I went to his session, and he talked for a good ten to fifteen minutes about what they specifically did. As he was the head, he's the head of the Massachusetts Coastal Coalition. So there's going to be a there was going to be a big flood map change from okay. uh, Situate, Marshfield, and Duxbury on the south coast of Massachusetts, and he went through like meeting after meeting after meeting um, in all different kinds of fashions, like not just like show up and we're going to have a meeting, but they had outdoor meetings. They brought people from FEMA in, okay. really talking about this is how this change is going to affect you. And Joe said something funny, you know, something to the effect of like, he showed a picture and there were a bunch of people and he's like, and okay, here's another meeting with a lot of angry people. And then here's another meeting with a lot of angry people. I mean, the people were angry, but what happened was the, the flood map change got instituted Mm -hmm. and people adopted, adapted to it. Totally. Right. So it's exactly what you're talking about. It's how, how do we, how do we, uh, insert technology in but then it's the marketing part of it i don't mean marketing trying to sell something but the marketing and hey you, you need to keep using this and and it's up to the company as well the insurance company to keep figure out how can we how can we preach the message of loss control uh risk control risk management because it's in their best interest Oh, totally. Um, I feel like everyone thinks it has to be a sea change all at once. That it has to be a change in the guard instantaneously. Um, I, Ryan Hanley had a post about uh, brokers not handing over their agencies, you know, holding on too long. Um, and I just commented, why not have almost a startup within the brokerage, you know, a business that'll eventually take over the parent business. And I would almost do it on a two tiered opt in program where your premium is X, but if you're willing to participate in said program, if you do X benchmarks, you know, you can drop the rate down. And I'm sure those exist, but I I think too often we look to flip a switch when it should be more of a gradual changeover. You know, being a New England guy, it should be like boiling a crab. You know, it shouldn't be like microwaving fish, you know, it'll be, you know. That's Uh, a good point. That's a great, that's a great analogy. So, hey, since this is informal, yeah, I'm going to take a quick pause. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like my cat scratching at the door. So I think we'll make uh, video history, maybe audio history as well. That cat's going to annoy the hell out of me unless I open <laughs> this door. So hold on one second. In a, in a second, you'll see the cat jump up over my over my right shoulder. We have two two special guests today. You know, two special guests. Yes, one is Polly Cat, so uh, she'll be up. She's been in some other videos before, so no, usually no. And over my left shoulder, you can see when worlds collide. Yeah, and, and I need to pick that up. I, yeah. the, sale, the sales barrier uh, from Randy Schwantz. So uh, we just had him. We just he was. I think it was the latest podcast. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is my room. I, I haven't uh, hung up the Gronk shirt yet, yeah. or or any sports memorabilia. You caught me in the den. This is you know my beautiful wife. You know this was her style. I mean, I, I feel like you know I may get these as well, but she gets credit for the uh, the nice decor. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was gonna give you credit, <laughs> and I was gonna say, nah. man, you're you're fancy. I think I have like a velvet tiger from Mexico inside the bedroom that I've kept, you know, <laughs> I've got that like an ugly chair or my, uh, you know, my yeah. hold on items. Okay. So I, I want to go back. Uh, so we met via Tony mm-hmm. and, but uh, we, we actually bumped into each other in Orange County. Yeah, that was awesome. I, I appreciate you inviting me down. Um, you know, Bob was great to meet talking with Jeff Kled still too. 
Um, I've loved the insurance community to keep up with Ashley Fitzsimmons. I don't even mean the name drop. It's just great people that, you know, intelligent. And I actually worked at a church between 18 to 21. And I love sales. I group around sales. I think it's the key to, you know, help and grow a business, maybe potentially run into small business. But there's also that, you know, pastoral side, you know, I've coached a couple times, I like taking care of people. And I thought that was the coolest thing about finding this industry. You can do really well financially, but you're also protecting people's livelihoods, their families, their businesses. Mm-hmm. There's a, you know, a great moral there too, you know. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing, right? That's, yeah. To me is getting people back mm-hmm. to where they are. Uh, I still think there's a lot of room on the table. Like exactly what we just talked about. Like I think insurers do not spend enough time focusing on preventing the risk, preventing Mm -hmm. the loss, right? Mitigating the risk. They just don't spend enough time doing that. That's my, that's my big frustration. Like it, I, with all of this technology coming on board, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, insurance is going to be a lot different now. Totally. And that That's the fun part. Like trying to explain it to a young person, like there's, you have a, you have a long runway. Yeah. You know, I can. You come into insurance. And so, but it's going to, it's not going to be the old sleepy industry that it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. And I still have a toe in the industry. Uh, the company I'm working for has a great tax advantage wellness plan that uses a little bit of that, you know, 125 portion of your, uh, your paycheck to get supplemental benefits for employees. Um, and so that's been great to learn another side of the industry and you can see that side. Um, yeah, I think there's a huge runway in the next five years. I think the startups, even though it may be a little bit overdone, I think they're in the right place, right time. I think the industry is gonna be a little bit set in about five years, but you can still collect opportunities from people who are kind of slowing down, winding down. Um, I think something that goes under appreciated or unexpected is once Tesla got big enough to garner attention, the big, uh, the big auto industry companies started pumping money in and were like, okay, fine, we'll beat them. It was 0.5% now it's 0.1% or sorry, 0.5% now it's 1% of the auto market. It makes sense for us. I think the major carriers, you've seen it, you know, they have their incubators, they're jumping in the startups. I think they're going to come in like sleeping giants pretty soon here. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah. Well, that's, that was, you know, my original article on lemonade. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, don't believe the hype article. Mm-hmm. The gist of it was not to to shit on lemonade, right? The gist was it was a lot of hype, and the idea is like from a startup perspective, they have they're gonna, they can do a lot of really good stuff, but at the end of the day, insurance is a product that people don't really want to buy, <laughs> and yeah. it's capital intensive. And it's yeah. you know Warren Buffett says it, insurance is a mediocre business. It's got thin profit margins. So I love the tech stuff, but at the end of the day, when, if the big insurers really want to flex their muscle, State Farm has over $100 billion of assets. Yeah, and the small guys aren't necessarily going to fight fair, especially the funded ones, because they don't have to pay attention to traditional business metrics. I think they're looking to grow and spin off and glob on to somebody. Um, I'm not sure if they have to get their numbers right, so it's not oh, completely. an apples to apples yeah. battle. Yeah, we face that at my day job. Uh, you know, funded little startups versus a company that's got a keep track of traditional metrics, you know? Well, I mean, uh, Lemonade is not using yeah. traditional metrics or, right. or they're not being judged by traditional metrics. You know, um, their the, you know, loss ratios are just not good. Market share is growing, but I, you know, one, one thing that I've criticized is that uh, growth in insurance is very dangerous. Mm. Uh, it has never worked really. Uh, you don't see a lot of companies that grow rapidly. Uh, because it's too capital intensive. The amount of capital that you need, the amount of reinsurance you need grows faster than you can grow that premium. Yeah. And so your, your expenses get out of control and a lot of it's in accounting issues. But uh, you know, they, to me, when, when I see what Lemonade's doing, mm-hmm. my sense is they're planning for, you know, a major exit. Like they're, so. they're trying to get to a certain size and then sell the technology, sell the business, to you know a a carrier that's just like well we could start our own but or we could just buy them and then sell the contact base too absolutely yeah Yeah. they're they're gonna make a ton of money yeah so it let's 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 just be clear as much as i crap on lemonade they if i i would be an investor probably (laughs) 
because I look at what the, uh, you know, the founders are doing and they're, they're doing all the things that you would want to do if you were an investor, mm -hmm. you know? And then Stephen Goldstein just wrote a great article on them about how intelligently they've marketed and how there's education behind it. I know we've had a lot of marketing videos lately from insurance agents to get their names out there. Uh, I'm not sure how much they've used it for binds or for instruction. Uh, education, you know, education, education, I think is going to be key going forward and getting people more aware of what's going on. Yeah. Speaking of, I think we have a friend we can invite in who's always very good at educating people on a topic. I should see if we can. Uh, Let's get, get him in. in. Let's try. Give him a little buzz here. Special, special guest. Da, da, da. <laughs> this is just me, you know, making make believe like the sports podcast I love, you yeah. know. So we'll give him a call in. By the way, I love your hat. Thank you, sir. Yeah, this is a. Uh, so where, where, where are you originally from? <laughs> LA County. I think I just like being a pest, you know, and uh, I just love Larry Bird, love Paul Pierce. I used to joke around that I liked athletes who looked like they drank a lot of beer, but could score basketball. <laughs> and then, uh, well, it's funny. James Harden has uh, built his physique. He looks a okay. lot better now, yeah. but that's why I like James Harden because I feel like, well, with a, a guy with that body, if he can do that, then I can yeah. do that. He's a fullback with the basketball. Yeah. He's like yeah. barrel, barrel chested, skinny yeah. legs, you know, although he might, he might be on something now. He, he's, he's uh, pretty much building out his body. He's not LeBron James, but I, think uh, I, I, I enjoy watching him a lot. Oh no, he's, he's awesome. What he does. Um, Jalen Rose talks about how basketball players used to work out and now they train. I think insurance companies used to sell and now they're diving into the analytics. And don't get me wrong, I still feel like I'm in the old camp. I have a sales background. I feel like Paul Bunyan versus a steam-powered act sometimes. Um, you need the best of both worlds, though, too. I, mean, I think the toughness from the, the Gen X and the uh, baby boomers that kind of missing on the, the quote-unquote millennial side that I fit in. And there's so much I could do even with just Google Drive these days that would blow people's minds that aren't, you know, think about utilizing technology in different ways, you know? Yeah. So, To me, the sales culture is, I'm, I'm sad that it's missing. It's uh, fun. I, I, yeah. It's important, right? And, and I think even if you're not like that door-to-door -door salesman, yeah. having sales wisdom mm -hmm. in the organization <laughs> makes your marketing better, makes your product offering better just makes your organization better if you know how to sell it. I, I love sales. You know, I, I didn't think I would. I grew up around it. My dad joked around about being like Sisyphus, you know, rolling a stone up a hill. <laughs> um, be polite, be to the point, find fit, you know, bring a service, add value. Uh, I definitely understand where the negative connotations come in, but I think about it as the guy who kind of gathers for his clan. And I also think about the guy who, bring something beneficial for the community. And that's how you play the long game. Plus we're not, you can't disappear these days. You know, um, you have to pay attention to reputation. You have to uh, provide value. And that's something I'm pushing at the company I'm working at right now, everything HR. Um, let's give away more, let's give away more docs. Um, luckily one of the comp survey guys was like, hey, I'm willing to do this for free. Um, let's help before we ask. It's definitely the nature of the game these days. Yes, yeah, so I, I follow uh, Jeb Blount, mm -hmm. Anthony, Iannini. he's Italian, I should know this. It's Yanarino, but I think okay. he pronounces it differently. Um, and people have a misunderstanding of what sales is, and they'll tell you, sales is just an exchange of value. Yeah, exactly. That's it. exactly. And so, you know, that's why people that call you out of the blue, you cringe at, because... They are disrupting you. They are they are taking away value, and so they they better make up for it quickly, or else it's going to be a one one you know one sided offering. I heard something uh, from Jeffrey Gittimer, and sorry just to jump in and kind of agree. Uh, he said the cold calls to set the appointment, and that kind of shifted how I thought about it. I always used it to kind of bucket uh, to find who fits where, what the need is, to kind of sort, and then you deliver. Um, but I also feel like cold calling helps you get the marbles out of your mouth. And, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a sudden appointment. You're not trying to sell, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's hugely important. You, you brought up, um, you know, it, you brought up a, uh, a line through the sales process. Like mm -hmm. salespeople know how to uncover value. Yeah. They're, they're experts at it. So if, if business is just all about exchanging value, you need wisdom on your team that knows what it is that you have that's a value and yep. what it is that you need to ask of the other person to exchange that value. So that's one thing. The other thing is 
salespeople are great at rooting out objections. Mm -hmm. They're great at figuring out what will a cus potential customer um, potentially dislike or right. potentially question or potentially be confused about our product offering. I think though too, a really good salesman, I'm stealing this from the Wolf of Wall Street's guy sales book. I've been listening on Audible lately and that's actually really good. Sell me yeah. this pen. It's got a nice grip. Uh, you don't always have to sell too. You know, sometimes your product isn't a fit and I think the right guys know when to drill down and know when to say, hey, check out this other thing. Yeah. Um, I've always been really impressed by salesmen who kind of give away a close uh, because they know it's not in best, you know, interest of a customer. And you don't see it all the time, but when you see it, you know, it's great. The other thing, and speaking of insurance, speaking of needing to hire the next generation, sometimes you're at like Carl's Jr. even, and there's just somebody who's awesome. I think insurance could also do a good job of just keeping an eye out for uh, the next, you know, people who are going to be great at help. Uh, I think I hey, think hey. we have a I think we have a special guest. Hey. Someone someone has dialed in. Who is this? I I think you're you're right. This is Emerson Willis. <laughs> Emerson Willis is, is that the Emerson Willis of the Yep Insurance? This is this is him. He is I. How is everybody today? Welcome. <laughs> New good man. How you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what's up, Brad? What's up, Nick? We're, we're just wrapping. We, we, uh, as you chimed in, we were talking about the importance of uh, sales and having good salespeople in an organization. And now mm -hmm. we have uh, what I consider one of, the, one of the premier, one of the brightest minds when it comes <laughs> to using technology to uh, streamline the sales process. Mm -hmm. Emerson Willis, how's it going? Hey, hey, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Hey, it's going really, really well. Um, enjoying the weekend, some beautiful weather out here in Colorado. Yeah, I can't complain, you know. Um, yeah, how about you guys? We're great. Are, are the Rockies still in first place? You know, I honestly haven't been watching for the last few days. I, 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 I don't, I think they crushed, uh, crushed their last game, like 10 to 8 from what I heard um, last night, but uh, I don't think they're in first. I don't know. I'll have to double check them. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Brett, do you know who's in first in the American League East? Let's check it out. And then um, it's probably the Yankees. That's going to make me cringe. What episode <laughs> podcast is Emerson on? He, uh, it was like episode six or something, right? I caught your guys' podcast back in the day, and that's how I don't we... think it was that early, but I'll look it up while we have Emerson on the line. Yeah, Emerson, we ju I just I got was... back from the flood conference. We missed you. I know. How was that? I heard. I heard some good things about it. There were over a so thousand far. people there. It was. That's it was, insane. It was pretty amazing. That's great. Um, there's a yeah, big we push. To be there. There's a big push uh -huh. um, from, you know, the NFIP or, you know, just the, the government agencies. They, they have a uh -huh. moon, moonshot goal of doubling the number of flood insurance policies that are sold in the United States. And they really don't uh -huh. care um, how they get sold, whether it's public, private. They're just trying to get people to buy. Um, are they going to do it through zone changes or just more of educational, try to help people be encouraged is that their, their, their yeah i think it's education goal? i think it's just hey uh folks you have exposure by flood insurance okay i think you know I, I think i don't think it's impossible um i definitely know you know just from from our experience which is quite a bit and you know generally speaking we have a lot of these guys in the flood zones and they don't they they actually have a pretty high risk of flood, some of these guys, and I hear it over and over and over. I don't even want this flood insurance policy. And so it's not impossible, but I think technology and, you know, more more communication, helping people understand better the risk. You know, unfortunately, people generally tend to learn through others' mistakes or their own. Um, and so, like, when we had Hur Hurricane Harvey and Irma last year, our 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 website and phones were blowing up for mm. for flood insurance requests, but it's this thing that it only lasts for a little bit. It's like complacency sets in shortly thereafter. You know, it's weird. Yeah, no, um, but I, I would I'm not going to be negative about it. I, I would love to see that happen. I mean, uh, I, I think it needs to happen for sure. 
Yeah, that's the hard part about all of our industries all the way around. You know, the the day job, everything HR, yeah, it's not until people have a huge workplace issue that we can usually get them to sign up. It's like, hold on to our info just in case and then wait, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, flood, it's a little bit yeah. more serious. There's not necessarily paperwork you can do to solve that problem, you know, in the aftermath. Yeah. So. But yeah, we've well, been talking. Well, it's funny with flood. Oh, sorry, God, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, oh no, you're good. You're good. Um, but yeah, we've been talking about tech. We've been talking about the industry, sales. Yeah. I know you two have just always loved rapping on floods. So that'd be fun to get you in here. I was talking about the uh, the connections I've made yeah. and kept up with. You know, you, you know, Pat West, yeah. you guys top of the list. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Pat West is a great guy. Hazard Hub, and um, I think he just got his flood page up live. Nice. Literally, I think yesterday. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting stuff. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's definitely technology is definitely making its way in into the in, uh, into the space. You know, it is interesting with a lot of the flood carriers. I would say, other than maybe one or two, I would say they're kind of behind the uh, behind the the times of, a little bit on technology. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity in the flood space to, for technology to come in and make a big difference and help those people who don't have flood insurance you don't have a better view on it so yeah nick if we're not going into the weeds too much or anything kind of you know company kind of private anything kind of fun you've been coming across how's your journey been building out your company we're startups so it it's slow tracking we're in the middle of a proof of concept with uh a a large reinsurer mm. Um, we're actively writing coverage. Cool. Okay, great. Um, I, I bumped into Emerson last week, so um, I'm hoping we can help yeah. them on a couple of things that uh -huh. they're working on now. I, uh, Emerson, let your dad know that I have the team busily working on uh, the two or three accounts that he sent me. So we'll we'll oh, really we'll be able to do some stuff for you. But you know the hard, nice. the hard part, Brett, is that so. If you think of insurance, we, I, we break it down to this into these pieces. There's uh, there's the product itself. Mm -hmm. There's selling the product. Then there's the capacity that supports the product. Mm -hmm. And then there's the technology that kind of weaves through every aspect of it. And when you're a startup, you have none of those nailed down. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so you feel very vulnerable. Sure. You know, it's uh -huh. like at, at any moment, like you're, you're walk you're, you're, you're walking a, a tightrope. Mm -hmm. Any mm -hmm. moment, uh -huh. a gust of wind or whatever could knock you over. And that's what it feels like. Although, you know, I, I think we've, we've weathered this pretty well. Um, it's going slower, a little bit slower than anticipated, but I think we set some really big expectations for what we want to do. Hopefully this doesn't scare you, but in my moving project management days, I always said if you just doubled the budget you thought you needed and doubled the timeline, you'd be fine. You know, everything would go perfect. <laughs> okay, well, since oh, you brought man. since you brought that up, if yeah. that if that had <laughs> happened, everything would be perfect. <laughs> It'll be good. You know, be good. <laughs> you know that well, you know part part of the problem with a startup is that you constantly feel like you're running out of money. Mm -hmm. You I know, and that. so yeah. there's there's financial pressure because you feel like we, you know, we got to start making sales faster because we need that revenue. Yeah. So there's, I can see why, you know, in a startup world, um, you know, uh, the, the teams end up bending the rules a little bit because there's just so much pressure. It's just like, Hey, I know this is outside of our traditional ethics, but mm -hmm. man, we got, we got to make some sales or get off target. That, that's the thing I'd be prone to do. And luckily we're kind of anchored in at the day job, but um, to kind of look peripherally and be like, oh, can I make money here? Can I make money here? But it gets you off the core objective, you know, staying true to course, yeah. even if there might be ways to change the process. So, that's a really good point, Brett. That's the one thing kind of because we're kind of an agency startup. We got our own little side projects going on and I think everybody can relate to that. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to go, hey, look, a dog, you know, and then now you're, you know, you can get off focus easy. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I've found that when you take those rabbit trails, it gives you a new perspective and you look back at where you were and you're like, hold on a second. You know, it, it, it's weird how perspective changes. Mm -hmm. And even having a conversation with one other person can really, you know, shed some new light on what you're looking at. And it, it can change things. You know, it's like, like Nick said, it's like walking a tightrope and 
you got to be open-minded and razor sharp focus at the same time. So it's a delicate balance for sure. A, I, I think the band Wilco can take themselves a little bit too seriously at times, but they're really good. <laughs> and I heard Jeff uh-huh. Tweedy say one time that you'll have a song you like, you have to take it too far and kind of destroy it. And then out of the wreckage of something <laughs> that was good, you create a song you never could have in a direct manner. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the creative uh-huh. artistry that I think goes hand in hand with, uh, you know, with entrepreneurial efforts with startups, you know, um, it's like the sales high on steroids, you know, um, trying to find out how to make something work. You know. We, we yeah. are, we are involved in probably a project or two that, you know, sort of fits what we're trying to do. And definitely in the long term, um, it, it definitely overlaps with what mm-hmm. it is that we're trying to do, but in the short term, it's a bit of a distraction. Like we definitely have more pressing things that we need to focus on. And this thing just keeps bubbling up here or there. And I have to like carve out time. And um, that, I guess that's the, uh, Emerson, I'd like to hear your feel on this. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. my frustrating, the most frustrating thing that I deal with on a day to day basis going through, you know, a startup to something that's a little bit more mature is that Mm -hmm. I function best when I can really focus on something. So if Mm -hmm. I can like carve out time and just like, just give it my all and I am constantly distracted, you know, it's uh, employees, uh, Slack, email, phone calls. Like I just can't seem to focus on the thing I really need to work on. And so I'm not, I'm not giving it my best effort and, and, and it, and, it, I'm distracted. Like I just, I can't, my mind yeah. just starts moving all over the place. I totally, I, I, you know what I think it's, I think it comes by nature, especially when you're a creative person and you're, and you're, you're really going after things from an entrepreneurial spirit. The one thing that I've found, it goes there. Here's the thing. There's no perfect answer to that because I would say the greatest thing I've discovered in this recent journey happened just because of kind of like Brett said, you know, you, 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 you pick something out of the rebel of it all, the rebel of it. And, you know, for, for us, I, I would say it's good to have like an accountability partner, but see, then I, t- I take that back because my accountability partner is like, dude, you're going on a tangent here. Stop it. You got to <laughs> focus on the main thing. But I'm, but see, that's how some people, myself included, I think you have to really know yourself. I think if you take good account of what it is you do and try to, I don't know, keep, keep tabs on it and inventory, I think it can help. But I, I actually thrive on chaos. So, um, you know, these tangents actually kind of, they just, I'm, I'm a creator in mind. So I have to have some of that. It definitely, I think can overstep territories. And that's where I think the, taking inventory on it as well and I think maybe some people uh depending on your you know your character and your your style some people might need to go look I had literally have to shed these things I can't have them period I know people do that I, I maybe I'm not disciplined maybe I should <laughs> so but but again I don't know I think everybody's situation could be unique you know um uh so I don't know I would say if someone really get wants to get razor focused I would say a really good accountability partner, someone that you would look up to as like a mentor that would say, Hey, so what do you, what do you got going on lately? And you know what they're looking for. Are you staying on target? You know, are you, you know, how's your progress going on that main super top high end priority? Hmm. My buddy that helped me out with that, he's actually a marketing partner as well. He gave me a schedule for my day that I put on my calendar that broke the day down into some different phases. Mm-hmm. And I won't say I stuck to it perfectly, but it definitely helps because there's a certain part of the day where I literally am carved out. I will not let any small distractions pop in, but my highest priority focus happens in that time. And it's like, so, I mean, there's... Do you, do you think that would work for everybody, Emerson? I, you know, I, that's why, that's, that's the thing is, I think everybody's unique and I think what they're trying to do is unique as well. I think there's so many variables. I think it's okay. I think it's great to have structure and maybe be aware of your, 
of your your time allotment that you spend you know at least like maybe take a record of it kind of like a food journal you know what i mean if someone has like better days bad days if they take a food journal you might be like oh wow every time i eat this food i feel groggy and tired like maybe there's certain events or things that you do where it's like man i didn't know i didn't realize i spent that much time doing that that's killing me you know i, I think <laughs> so. too um and sorry emerson just to jump in on a real a real meat and potato side i heard that the first three hours of your day are your most productive for heavy lifting so maybe you just ignore everybody like 8 a.m to noon and then second half of the day could be some of that sorting problem chasing down all that good stuff just from a real simple standpoint and then i used to color coat my calendar when I'd feel kind of overwhelmed, I'd have blocks and just knowing I'm in this block help, this block kind of going back to what Emerson said. Yeah. A great, that's a great topic, though, honestly. I think that's something where uh, it, it, it's a huge one. I think it can, it can be a game changer between your pro productivity. If you actually analyzed and saw how much time you allocated and you looked at it on a larger scale and looked at it like from an annual standpoint, you might go, wow, I spent – this much time doing that like if I actually dedicated that to this over here what would happen you know would it be like two or three acting your actual productivity it's yeah but I, I agree with you you gotta I think starting your day off on the right foot is really key and like having a a very positive attitude because I've, I've I've been a victim of that of, of myself sometimes you just don't get started on the right day and, and, and attitude is choosable you know what I mean it doesn't matter how bad your circumstances are but you can start off kind of negative and it can bleed into your, your work, you know, your productivity. So. Completely. No, completely. So uh, I would like to transition to sports. Nice. If, uh, if that's okay. So uh, Emerson, yeah. how much basketball do you like? I love basketball. I uh, played it growing up. If you're going to ask about stats, I'm going to be here. <laughs> no. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one, where, where do you guys think LeBron will end up? It's going to be entertaining. I think the Lakers uh, or the Clippers, but I think Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a Celtics fan, but I have to listen to way too much ESPN radio driving around. So I feel like I follow Lakers pretty intently too. But I think he's going to end up in L.A. just family-wise, business-wise, opportunity-wise, um, paychecks-wise, you know. If I had a bet, I'd put money there. Emerson, that's probably why. That's a that's a wise decision. I, I I couldn't go against that. I mean, he's a obviously he's a top player. Um, yeah, I I don't have any educated response that would back anything up. So it would literally be a wild card. But hey, L A could be a good choice. Yeah. Okay. So is there any chance he ends up in Boston? He's sort of. Yeah, the mechanics are there. It makes sense. Maybe. Kind of super team versus super team. Um, so so, yeah. so I, I was watching uh, – who was it? It was on ESPN. It was uh, Vince Carter. Mm -hmm. so I was watching a, a YouTube of some ESPN recording, and I thought Vince Carter kind of nailed it. He said, LeBron's James, LeBron James' complete focus is he wants to be known as the greatest player that ever lived. Mm-hmm. How do we measure that? Chips. But he's already down. What is he? Uh, three for nine. Okay. So yeah. he goes to the Western Conference. He may not even get to the finals. Yeah. He goes to Boston. Ooh. He's in the finals every year for the rest of his career. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the okay. assets are that's ridiculous. A, that's a pretty good point. Okay. That's <laughs> so, a very good point. With that said, I don't want him in Boston. That right. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so if LeBron – let's say LeBron does go to L.A., do you think there's enough there for then the Lakers to get Kawhi Leonard? I don't think you'd want to do that because you'd have to empty the cupboard. I think they'll go get Paul George. Maybe like a, a 1A, 1B kind of thing. It's not quite Kawhi. Um, but with Kawhi's kind of looming health stuff, uh, I think Paul George would be the better fit anyways. So, a Any opinions, Emerson? You know, again, uh, no, not on that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we trust each other. You know, Emerson's got flood. I got Celtics basketball, you know, a little bit of HR. Yeah, are, I, just, uh, uh, I, I, I wish I could give you something. That's hard to fake, though, right there. I can't pull that one off. <laughs> I wish my knowledge base was a little more functional, but, you know, it's fun. You know, the distraction, I think, is part of the production. You know, you got to have something you can nerd out on in order to get back to the heavy lifting. 
Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. So my, my guess is, uh, I think, I think LeBron's going to end up in Philadelphia. Yeah. I mean, there's conflict on style of play, but there's some talent there and it's not going to a rival and he gets to stay in the East. You yeah. Know? I think he needs to stay in the East. If, yeah. his, if his goal is truly to be the greatest ever, Western Conference is a gauntlet. Like that is just, there's so much talent out there and, and Golden State is, may not have reached their peak yet. I think he needs five more rings, though. I know Jordan has six. You know, Bill Russell has 11. I want to say Kareem has, like, eight. But he'd have to get, like, five more in, like, potentially seven years. Yeah, I, I don't I, – I think the way the media works, my opinion, yeah. is um, they it we they fall into the recency bias. Okay, okay. So if yeah. he just won a couple more, that would give him five. Yeah. I feel like even with three, he has already surpassed Kobe in the eyes of the current – media only michael jordan is above him yeah kobe's top 15 kobe's a great score he's the closest thing we saw to michael but lebron is just like will with you know hustle you know he's crazy um he's just a different animal yeah okay so emerson do do you follow the denver nuggets you know i don't i'm sorry denver nuggets and colorado people but no i don't (laughs) who's your team Who's my team? Yeah. You know, honestly, I, here, here's what happened. I, and, I, and I hate to say it is I getting into this entrepreneurial world, like I love sport, but it's one of those things where I think I had only so much that I could have in my mind. Yeah. So certain things fell off. So like, in all honesty, like if I sat down and watched it, I could totally get into it. But if I don't, if I'm not in it all the way, I, I'm 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 like worthless. Like I either have to do it. I'm all in, or I'm I'm not at all. You know what I mean? You, got the, um, you know, with the music though, deep. right? Music's your thing where you probably deep dive and know who, you know emerging artists, right? Are killing it. Yeah, that's what that's what took my my sports mm-hmm. side of my brain that I the little room I had left in there. <laughs> um, you know, it was music because I do a lot of music. So it definitely that with family and then the business and mm-hmm. entrepreneurship, like. Yeah, I would love to get more into sports. I'd love to sit down and watch the games all the time then. So. I think you just need a deep dive, though. You need something because you're definitely going to work hard. You need another place where your brain can run around for a little bit. That's going to keep you fully distracted. And then you come back. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well I even I- chat with guys like you guys, like being able to have a conversation and talk about this. Stuff. That's fun. Like, I love that. Like, I, I don't like being like, hey, I don't have a clue. <laughs> so. Yeah, but we have fun talking about insurance and stuff, too. Uh, that's been, yeah, one of my biggest surprises and most pleasant things that came out of getting into the industry. Just great people, you know, thoughtful people. And uh, it's been a lot of fun making all these connections. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, so yeah. let's let's end this call. Let's end this video and this podcast with uh, some surprise prediction. So okay. uh, it's 2018. It can be anything. I don't really care. It can be music, okay. sports, politics. And what is what is one big thing that's going to happen in 2018 that's just going to shock the world? I got a, a weird local knowledge one that I'm kind of pulling from. I think it's kind of nuts. Uh, Eric Garcetti has been really cool around Los Angeles. I met the guy. Um, he, I think, is going to try to go from being LA's mayor to going for president, Democratic candidate for president. I'm just kind of blown at that leap, you know. Um, I guess Bloomberg was rattled around, you know, as somebody who might run for it, but that's just something random. I'm, I'm cheating. I'm using a somewhat factual thing, but um, I just thought that was kind of interesting from a local and national perspective, you know. So. Emerson. That's cool. Wow. What a, what a big question. I like it. I'm going to be thinking yeah. about this all day now. Um, you know, let's see where my mind goes. I was in the insurance side of my brain. Um, I, I have, I, I want to go down the, the, the route of saying, you know, something related to this industry and technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other side of my brain is wanting to say something about music. Um, Do something in music. But, Let's let's throw a curveball. Okay. Well, here's what I think will happen, and I, and this is what I'd love to see happen. So this might be more of a wish, but it's uh, also something I'd like to be involved in. But I I believe because of how the internet works and how technology works, 
And this year, and if not this year, maybe the following year, I, I think that there will be a technology that comes out that disrupts and completely revolutionizes how how music is discovered and levels the playing field for for not you know the big guys always get all the play and then and then there's so much saturation but i think that there will be an instance where um the small guys can rise to the surface just as easy and have an environment where they're more discoverable to the masses if you will kind of like there's apps that try to do this like Spotify. I don't know if you guys use music apps like Spotify. Um, but, you know, it would be something where it's kind of a world that that actually lifts up the bottom end versus the top end. So it kind of flips it over. It's like SoundCloud so and Spotify having a baby kind of, it sounds like, you know. Right, right, right. And it would. the thing is, is there's a lot of people that are, too busy to go out to a local show they're not going to go see a local band it's just something that they're not going to do but that doesn't mean they wouldn't necessarily go wow i really like this group technology is getting better to where bands can actually record very very high quality music that sounds just as good as all the big stuff um so it would just make the bands more discoverable things like facebook are so crowded that you you know there's too much noise on there and uh they, they squeeze out a lot of that entertainment stuff so no i think i think there will be a, a big transition in the, in the music space well, and i can tie it back to, to insurance kind of more geolocated smart devices smart communities um stuff that's sourced locally uh with local intelligence as opposed to just the same four tv channels you know if everything else is getting more specific and differentiated i'm sure the local stuff can emerge more than it has before you know uh, yeah absolutely i've kind of i have i have an entire startup idea on that that I, I i put together when phones were starting to be able to do ringtones mm. like like music ringtones you know you could like oh you could download your favorite song they were, before they were quite smart but um you know one thing i see being a person who plays in a band um they do these things called you know battles where these bands mm. will basically you know see who goes through you know a few rounds there might be a hundred bands and by the end of it one band gets the title but what you'll see is they're they're kind of just venues taking advantage of people's crowd bases and you know your crowd has to be so big for you to get certain votes but but what i think is there'll be a digital way for bands to have these contests to win certain things you know Mm -hmm. whether it's yeah, you know, it's. I just think technology is really going to start shaping that space in a different way. Um, so I don't know if that's a solid. <laughs> They're going to win cryptocurrency, and then. Uh, that's funny. Okay, so yeah, I don't know. That's all, that's all I got. Okay, <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that's good. That's, thank you. What's your uh, uh, What's your closing prediction? Okay. For, so, do uh, you guys know who uh, Aaron Burr is? Mm-hmm. In the whole Hamilton Burr. Uh, dual or whatever. Um, Thank you to a milk commercial in the nineties. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So uh, sure. I am going to say that on the floor of Congress, I don't know if it's the House of Representatives or the Senate, mm-hmm. there will be a fight. Okay. Almost like the House of Parliament. There There's go. there is going to be a, a a physical altercation. Fisticuffs. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know if someone's going to get hit with a cane. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I, I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but there's going to be, I think we're, we're in line for, uh, you know, some kind of physical altercation, which will not wake up the United States. Uh, I think it's just going to cause more, more conflict. So we got to find a, a prop bet for that. Somewhere. I love it. Yeah, it could be a 2018. Yeah. So if anyone, if anyone's listening, you have a good idea for how we can create a wager around this. <laughs> let's let's get it on there so hey guys i i don't want to take any more of your saturday it's uh i'm emerson said it's beautiful in colorado it's beautiful here in new hampshire and it's always beautiful in southern california yeah, so spoiled. you can't can't beat that but i appreciate appreciate you guys coming on and uh, having this conversation and uh emerson you're welcome anytime you could be i could be having a now that you have my, my conference call you could just dial in anytime you want even if i was <laughs> you know, having a meeting with the reinsurer. 
I could just pop in there and be like, "Hey guys, how's it going?" <laughs> hey, I got I this idea. I got this idea about music. You want to hear it? <laughs> if you can tie yeah, the music into the flood another, policies for spreading them out a little bit. Wanna, more. Yeah, if you guys want to do another a startup? We can build it into Rethought. You know, it'll be a music <laughs> app. I got, I got the idea. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Flood their eardrums with great music. Yeah, there you go. Okay, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Enjoy yeah, the re- enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And uh, for anyone that's listening or watching, until next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you, okay. Brian. Take care, guys. All right. All right. Cheers. See you. See you. Cheers.